I want to talk about uh, what's new in Gradualizer and in general about gradually typing Erlang and Elixir. Uh, but maybe first, uh, mm, why bother? Well, Erlang is a dynamically typed language, dynamically checked language. So what can we, how can we benefit from actually uh, having static type checking or gradual type checking in, in it? So I think that the first reason is uh, clarity, that using specs uh, and using types uh, helps us uh, clarify the interfaces and the intended use of uh, our code. Um, the second reason uh, is that I believe that, well, Erlang has been for a long time known for uh, great concurrency modeling primitives. Elixir has inherited that uh, from Erlang. And I think that nowadays, even when uh, other programming languages are catching up uh, with regard to uh, using concurrency and then also utilizing uh, parallelism, I still think that the Erlang and Elixir concurrency model is uh, a very convenient one to use. Uh, in my personal opinion, it's more convenient one than async await model of uh, red and blue functions um, that get viral. And thirdly, uh, if you have the chance to attend today's uh, talk by Daniel Beskin about making uh, illegal states unrepresentable, uh, then I think that a type checker can significantly uh, improve or maybe even enable using uh, dimension techniques in, la in a language like Erlang or uh, Elixir. So, uh, what I would like to talk about, uh, a short introduction, then about the state of the art in the Erlang ecosystem. Uh, I will show some numbers um, from comparing the different type checkers. Uh, I will demo gradient, which is an Elixir frontend to Gradualizer. Uh, then I will do a different type of comparison on a few selected examples of source code. I will try to draw some conclusions uh, from all of that. And then I will sum up with uh, what's newly developed and what's still on the to-do list uh, in these projects. So uh, first for the introduction. Um, I'm Radek Szymczyszyn, also known as Ersch, uh, on GitHub, Medium, Twitter. It's hard to pronounce, but it's easy to Google, so uh, please use that. <laughs> Um, I'm a tech lead at Erlang Solutions with uh, a bit over 10 years of experience. I'm also a static type system enthusiast uh, by what I mean that I have a CS background, uh, but I don't have a PhD or in general a degree in type theory or um, compiler theory. For approximately one and a half year, I have been contributing to Gradualizer uh, and I became a core team member because of that. Uh, together with uh, a colleague from the Krakow office of Erlang Solutions, Przemek Wojtasik, who is also here, we also created uh, an Elixir frontend to Gradualizer called Gradient. And what else? I also believe in good quality docs and good looking docs because uh, pretty docs make uh, programmers happy and happy programmers are better than grumpy ones. Um, so I co-authored uh, Erlang Enhancement Proposal 48 together with uh, Joseph Alim, who is probably somewhere here uh, on the conference. Um, and I implemented the part uh, of the specification in EDOC, which then was merged into Erlang 24. And in general, professionally, I'm an Erlang uh, programmer, Elixir uh, programmer, uh, I used to do quite a lot of XMPP in instant messaging. Nowadays, I'm a bit more uh, doing uh, Erlang and Elixir system architecture. So, uh, let's take a look around and, uh, um, well, consider the existing type checkers for uh, Erlang. So, probably the first work uh, in this area was done by uh, Simon Merlow and Philip Wadler, who tried to uh, use a system solving unification constraints of the subtyping form. Unlike uh, usual Hindley-Milner systems solving constraints of equality form, they successfully applied it to some uh, significant Erlang code bases, but 
ultimately the results uh, were not uh, completely satisfactory because the inference was uh, quite slow. The types, uh, the inferred types were large and complex, and sometimes uh, the results were simply incorrect due to quite complex pattern matching uh, that's present in Erlang. Um, so this tool is not really used in practice. It's, it's not widely adopted. The second actor on the stage, though, Dialyzer, um, invented by Tobias Lindahl and Kostis Saganas, is the most mature Erlang type checker. It's the most widely, widely adopted tool. Uh, nowadays, it's maintained by the OTP team. So it has the, let's say, the most official blessing it can get. Uh, however, it's a bit peculiar because it's a, a completely different system than Hindley Milner. So it's, uh, it's very unfamiliar to people coming from different statically typed languages. It uses the theory of success typings. And uh, there is a motto or a slogan associated with that, that dialyzer is never wrong. And it stems from the fact that uh, Dialyzer always assumes that the implementation is right. And only if it can prove, uh, if it can find a counterexample, uh, it reports errors. And uh, Dialyzer is the system that, well, to be frank, popularized the use of spec and type uh, annotations in Erlang source code in general. Uh, then the next actor is Earl T uh, from WhatsApp, uh, which is quite interesting because, well, technically speaking, it's uh, it's uh, a new programming language because it introduces some syntax elements uh, which are not uh, present in Erlang at all. So it's very similar, but it's not the same language. Um, it provides uh, optional static typing. It uses specs, but it allows for unchecked code if we mark it appropriately in the source code. Uh, however, it's discontinued by WhatsApp at this point. Um, so we're probably not going to see progress or wide adoption. But as far as I know, WhatsApp has not said the last word on uh, static typing of Erlang. So uh, we just have to stay tuned and see what's, what's coming from them. Uh, then we have ETC, uh, which stands for a long type checker, developed by Nechi Valiapan and John Hughes, which was a research project, uh, an experiment in applying a Hindley Milner system to Erlang. And the main takeaway here uh, is that it uh, enabled overloaded constructors, which is quite um, uncommon in Hindley Milner systems, I think. Because in Haskell or OCaml, the constructors of types have to just have to have unique names. Uh, they also utilize partial evaluation to improve type checking accuracy. But in general, um, this system requires code modifications to existing programs. Not necessarily complex modifications, but uh, it requires quite, quite a lot of them to use these constructors and to wrap um, data into, into tagged tuples, generally speaking. Then we have another uh, project, which is also called ETC, which is uh, quite amusing, but um, it's a different tool. It's developed by uh, Nathan Rajendra Kumar and Anit Binusa. It was described in a paper uh, called Bidirectional Typing for Erlang. Um, and as the name implies, it uses the, the approach of bidirectional typing, which um, is also called local type inference, which practically means that um, the type checker at different parts of the abstract syntax tree switches from type synthesis, from the available information, to type checking based on the available information. And this approach also plays nicely with uh, the fact that to uh, type check high ranked polymorphism, uh, we need uh, some type information provided by the programmer because otherwise the problem is uh, undecidable. And in general, the theory used by this tool uh, was described by Joshua Dunfield and Neil Krishnaswamy. And it was successfully applied in some programming languages like PureScript or Hackett or Discuss. 
So uh, there are some high hopes uh, just based on the theory used by, by this project. And last but not least, uh, there is the Geolizer and the Elixir Frontend Gradient, which was originally created by Josef Svenningson, um, who now works at Meta, aka Facebook, but is not really uh, very active in Gradualizer anymore. Um, so Gradualizer also uses bidirectional typing, but it has uh, somewhat different assumptions. So first, uh, it's opt-in. If there is no spec on a function, there will be no check performed um, over it. It's gradual, so any type, it assumes that any type information is better than uh, no, type, no type information. And it also uh, allows to use the any type as a dynamic type that will only be um, known at runtime. Um, it does not assume uh, type checking of message passing at all. It, 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 this is one of the assumptions that it will not uh, cover this part of the language. And uh, it's still an experimental project because there is yet no constraint solver for uh, solving um, type variable constraints. So there is no polymorphism support so far. Um, OK, so based on this information, I did a selection of some of the tools that I wanted to compare more closely. And these are dialyzer, uh, ETC, uh, the one by uh, Rajendra Kumar and Ganyusa, and Gradualizer. Uh, why not the others? Well, one of them is discontinued, one of them did return incorrect results, uh, and the third one um, requires a lot of source code modification. Um, since I'm quite familiar with the Gradualizer code base, uh, I tried to use the collection of tests, quite a significant collection of tests available in its repository. And this collection is divided into four categories, basically tests that should pass. Uh, tests that should pass, but we know they don't. Um, so these are known bugs. Uh, tests that should fail, so ultimately we want the tool to return some meaningful warnings and errors. Sorry. And also known bugs with regard to errors that should be returned, but are not returned. Um, details of this comparison are available online at this URL. But now let's uh, take a look at uh, some charts. So here we basically check uh, if our type checkers accept valid code. So the blue bar um, shows the number of tests in general. Since these are gradualizer tests, then, well, gradualizer passes all of them, which which not bad, but uh, <laughs> uh, not a big insight either. We also see that the most widely adopted type checker dialyzer is mostly on par uh, with regard to, to this test suite. And ETC does not fare that well. It only passes like one third uh, of the tests. So this is a hint that it might not be uh, fit for daily use, for production use uh, yet. Uh, then we have the known problems. So again, because uh, these are the gradualizer tests and these are the known problems, gradualizer does not pass any of them. Uh, just to, uh, I won't, to underline one thing, this graph shows the errors detected, not the tests passed. So it's like the opposite of the previous one. So here, lower is better. And we actually see that the Dalizer slogan that it's never wrong holds, holds true, or almost uh, holds true. Uh, ETC, similarly, is uh, somewhere in the middle. Then we have the should file category. So, as I said before, this is the category of uh, tests that we know are invalid, and we know the tools should actually report uh, warnings about them. Again, we show the errors detected. Again, these are gradualizer tests, so it passes all of them. But we can see that here, dialyzer is quite permissive. There's quite a big number of tests that do not fail, although we know uh, they should. And uh, again, ETC is somewhere between uh, the other two. 
And then we have the known problems about bugs which are not uh, discovered. So in general, these are the, the errors that type checkers cannot find at all. Uh, gradualizer cannot find any of them because they're written against gradualizer. Surprisingly, ETC is quite good here. Um, like 50% of the uh, bugs are found. Um, we can also see that dialyzer is quite permissive. And the last uh, chart is the runtime performance. So uh, this shows the average runtime averaged um, across all the tests that were checked in the comparison. So all the categories uh, should pass, should fail, and no pro non problems. We can see here that uh, gradualizer is the fastest one, ETC is pretty close, and dialyzer is uh, significantly slower. And at this point, uh, it's important to note that it uses a very basic PLT file. Um, so only with the basic apps like uh, STD, uh, lib, kernel, probably SASL. So if this file was bigger, it would take even longer. And also, we only check uh, a single source file per run of the tool. OK. So we have seen some numbers. We could say that dialyzer and gradualizer are pretty similar with regard to accepting good code. And dialyzer is a bit more permissive uh, with regard to accepting uh, bad code. So let's now see uh, the tool in action. OK, uh, if it's not big enough, please let me know so I can um, increase the font size. Yeah? OK, or more. OK, so here uh, on the left hand side, uh, we have a demo uh, server. So. In Erlang and Elixir, uh, there's this convention of uh, hiding the concurrency built-ins, so the built-ins used for spawning processes and for message passing be behind functional interfaces. So this is a convention that's, that's uh, quite old and quite widely adopted. But when we also apply, um, when we also use uh, type specs and uh, type definitions, we can um, like put this convention to the next level. So we cannot type message passing built-ins, but we can type check the functions that rob these message passing mechanisms. So let's see uh, how we can utilize that and how far we can push this approach uh, with uh, Gradualizer. Or in, in this case, Gradient, because this is Elixir code. So uh, one more thing for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Erlang or Elixir. Um, these tools come with uh, OTP, which is a set of building blocks and building principles. And one of the basic building blocks is called the gen server, which is basically a skeleton of a server that handles uh, requests and returns some responses. We fill in the details of this server with our business logic, uh, but the skeleton is there. It's, it's in the batteries included package so that uh, we can use it. And in this demo, I try to uh, make the message passing interface of a gen server a bit more declarative, um, which might ring uh, a bell if you're, s if you're familiar with the Elm architecture and uh, the way that the messages uh, handled by an Elm application are uh, handled. So our message type basically describes the, the protocol or the contract that uh, our messaging server will uh, handle. These are two uh, types of requests, echo request and hello request. And at this point, I also run um, IEX, the interactive Elixir shell. Start the necessary runtime support and type check this code. And OK, 
Uh, we got OK as the response. Uh, we recompiled the file just now, and uh, we ran the type checker on, on this file. Uh, it's good. So let me comment this out right now, and instead use this type definition, which only lists one of these uh, types. Recompile, type check. We see an error. The clause on line 68 cannot be reached. So let's jump there. And OK. This is a function which handles a uh, hello message. Well, so it's one of the messages, the one that we just commented out. Um, so what do we get here, really? Well, the type checker told us that we have some code that's not really used. So we discover some dead code. Well, good. Let's comment it out. We don't need it. Type check again. It's good again. Let's jump to the top of the file. And now I'll use the other definition of message. Uh, it's equivalent to the first one, but it just uh, uses the definitions of the types directly instead of referring to them in other modules. Let's run the type checker one more time. Remember that we have commented out some code at the bottom. Uh, and we see non-exhaustive patterns on line 63. So we jump there. We see the first clause of the same function uh, we have seen before, which handles the echo request. So previously, it detected uh, unused code. This time, it detects that we are not handling every option. So we get an exhaustivity check on uh, the type of our declared uh, message. OK, so let's uh, bring the previous implementation back by uncommenting. Let's type check. Good, back to normal. So um, how, how else can we use uh, the type checker? Well, let's say I'm making something uh, silly. For example, I have made a typo in, in the tag of the message. Let's type check this now. And obviously, echo rex is not an instance of our declared type, and the type checker helps us even without running anything. So that's nice. Uh, let's fix that again. OK. So we detected uh, unused code. We detected unhandled cases of the type. We detect silly typos and uh, mismatches between the value and the, the declared type. Uh, but it's all on the server implementation side. So let's jump to the top and uh, think if there is anything that we can actually do on the client side, so on the side of the process that calls this uh, server, and apparently, uh, yes, we can, use, we can use the same technique, so exhaustiveness checking on this side. Let's say that our response um, also had some variants. It, was, it could be echo response one and echo response two. So we can uh, match on these variants and do some further processing on each of them. And then uh, we would get, get, get the same support uh, from the from the type checker, if we omit one of them, if the response gets uh, extended with more variants, uh, the tool will help us. Uh, moreover, if we make any of the silly uh, typos, it will also be caught at this point. However, on this side um, of the call, we have to uh, take one thing into account. So. Uh, let's look at the type signature of GenServer call. And we can see here that the return value is actually a term. And term is the top of the typing hierarchy. So it's the, it's the most general type there can exist in the system. Uh, and obviously with this information or this lack of information, the type checker cannot do much. But uh, we can help the type checker help us by providing some more specific info. And this more specific info is here. Uh, we know that in this particular type of server, the response will be of this type. And we provide this information here via the annotate type macro. If this uh, feels a bit heavy, we can also make it uh, slightly more uh, elixir uh, by using the pipe uh, operator like this. Let's uh, type check that. Looks good. And uh, if this still feels uh, well and natural, 
We can also uh, just create an auxiliary function, uh, which basically does exactly the same thing. So it just calls a uh, server call with our uh, request. But here in the spec of this function, we provide this type of information, contract echo uh, response. The important thing here is that we have to let the type checker know somehow. And we have to let it know about this. Whether it's through the spec or whether it's through the annotate type macro, it doesn't matter. And uh, from the performance perspective, annotate type is a no-op. It does nothing at runtime. It only embeds this extra bit of information in the AST so the type checker can use it. Well, OK, so far so good. But at this point, we could ask, can we still use it for something more? for a bit more uh, confidence. And uh, it turns out that yes. Uh, so let's look at the example um, first. We have a test where we start uh, two processes. One of them is our server, which we start with start link. The other one is a random process, which we start with spawn. And it basically blocks on a receive and, and, and waits. So let's run this test and see what happens. And OK, we get the payload. Mm. Nothing groundbreaking. But uh, now we uncomment this uh, last line and we run the test again. And oops, well, something, something fishy is going on. So uh, it turns out that uh, we stumbled upon a runtime error. It's a timeout in the gen server call. And um, so let's take a closer look and see what's going on. In the first case, on line 100, uh, we use our server API with our server. That's fine. In the second case, we use our uh, server API with a random process. And there is nothing in the Erlang VM preventing us from doing that. But here, thanks to the type checker, uh, well, I didn't show that yet, so I will now. <laughs> here, thanks to the type checker, we can actually uh, detect that before runtime, at compile time, uh, ideally in, in CI or even directly in our code editor, just when we write the line. So we get feedback that the variable PID on line 102 is expected to have type T but it has type PID. So where does this T come from then? We already know that feedback will be uh, provided for line 102, but we don't know what T is. So let's take a look at the top of our gen server again. And here we define something like opaque T, uh, which is defined as PID. So ultimately, this really is a PID. But on the type level, it's distinct. So now. Uh, all of our API functions, instead of returning a PID, API functions of this particular server, of course, instead of returning a PID, return T. Uh, all of them also accept T instead of uh, an ordinary PID. And thanks to that, our server API is type safe, and we cannot uh, misuse it with a server or a process of, uh, of a different kind. And. Yes, so that's it for the demo. Well, uh, Lynn Storvald says that uh, talk is cheap, show me the code. So I did. I hope uh, you're at least a bit convinced that the thing works. Uh, so um, I have some more slides um, to show at uh, this point. Because I could try um, showing it all interactively in the editor, but it would take a lot more time. And I did uh, do some comparisons beforehand. So there are more things the type checker can detect. And there are also uh, interesting cases where the type checkers don't agree on what they detect. So it's important to cross-check between them uh, to just gain, uh, gain feedback, gain insight into uh, how they compare. So some of these, of these issues are pretty serious, like this one. So let's take a look. We have function f1. It, it advertises that it returns a boolean. 
in the function body we see that it calls G1. G1 uses the any uh, type, so the dynamic type. But in the function body we see that it runs 3. So 3 definitely is not of type boolean, it's an integer obviously. But because gradualizer tries to be uh, a gradual type uh, system, it has to accept the dynamic type in places like this one. So uh, when we run dialyzer on this uh, test, we will see that it infers uh, the value of uh, the written value of G1 as an integer uh, as three, and dialyzer is right about it. And gradualizer accepts this code as is. And here we run into an issue called type soundness. Um, so what what type soundness is actually? Uh, basically, we can say that it's a property that says that if we have an um, unevaluated value, like a function call, and we know that it should be of some certain type, then when the runtime evaluates it, uh, it does all the additions, multiplications, subtractions, any computations in general, the ultimate uh, final value should be of the same type. In this case, we clearly see it's not the case. So. If something can go wrong in a type checker, it's, it's being unsound, and this is the case. And uh, just to check uh, it in practice, if we call that in a position uh, where actually a boolean is expected, uh, we'll get a runtime error, a bad argument. So it's not critical in Erlang or Elixir because these are dynamically typed languages, and even in this light, everything is checked. Uh, even in light of the spec being wrong, everything is checked at runtime, so no unsafe operation will be performed. But it's bad for documentation purposes, and it's bad also for um, reasoning about the code, because we just can't reason if, if we're getting uh, wrong information. And now, the original paper by uh, Jeremy Sieg and Walid Taha which uh, so the people who actually coined the term gradual typing says that in such a situation where we have a cast from any to a known static type, there should be a runtime um, check injected. Gradualizer is not a compiler, so it does not inject any code or any checks. And uh, actually, frankly, this is an unresolved uh, problem yet. However, going back to cross-checking between the tools, not all issues are that grave. Some of them are trivial. They just have a bit different approach to type checking unexported function, functions. So uh, in one of the other test cases, just if we export uh, L slash one, they start to agree. So dialyzer is happy and gradualizer is happy. Okay, so from some other example, we can tell that dialyzer seems to be better at type inference. So here we have uh, a function that declares to return an integer, but it actually returns another function. This another function does not have a type, type spec at all. Dialyzer uh, rightly infers uh, the success typing of, of the top function. Uh, gradualizer does not unless we pass an extra flag. So there is also some tweaking involved. But when we do, the tools agree one more time, so it's good. ETC sadly crashes on this example, so we can see uh, here and in some other uh, cases too that it doesn't yet cover uh, the full uh, Erlang syntax and uh, all the constructs uh, available in the language. But sometimes the is better at type inference, but sometimes it's uh, quite vague in what it uh, reports. And this is an example of, of this vagueness. So in this case, uh, we have a function with a pretty clear spec. It should accept a boolean, it should return an integer. We look at the definitions, there are two clauses. One accepts true, good. The other accepts false, good. Boolean is exhausted. But the one clause returns one, which is an integer. The other clause returns APA, which definitely is not an integer. By default, dialyzer does not see an error. Only if we use no NSW spec diffs, it does see an error. And why is that so? Basically, dialyzer uh, bases its, uh, its results also on the use cases 
or on the call sites of our code. If this function does not have any local call sites in the module, but it's exported, then, well, in our entire application, nothing might ever call C with the argument false. So the program will never crash. So for dialyzer, it's not an error. So depending on our taste, we might like it. Uh, we might like a type checker to be a bit stricter and to actually check our implementation against the spec. And that's what Gradualizer does. And then there's one more feature uh, that was mentioned uh, a few times on various talks uh, here, which is called exhaustiveness checking or exhaustivity checking, uh, which is present in other statically typed uh, languages. So basically, in, in this spec, we say that foo2 should accept an integer. But in the implementation, we clearly see that it only accepts two specific integers. So with dialyzer, we can detect that only with extra flags. And uh, yeah, uh, gradualizer, on the other hand, uh, by default, uh, tells us that there are non-exhaustive patterns and presents an example of, uh, of an unhandled value. Let's proceed with exhaustiveness checking examples. Here we have something. Uh, more common or more familiar from other programming languages like uh, algebraic data types or union types. This is specifically un useful for uh, making illegal types unrep unrepresentable. And again, uh, we have a function that uses this type. It accepts that it uh, declares that in the spec. We have a case uh, statement over a value of this type but it's incomplete. It only accepts one of the uh, variants. Uh, dialyzer detects that, but only with uh, spectives. With under specs, or with over specs, or with no options at all, it will be silent. Gradualizer, by default, will report non-exhaustive patterns and uh, present an unhandled uh, value. Um, so we mentioned these options, under specs, over specs, uh, spec diffs. There's one more example. This one comes from bidirectional typing for Erlang, so from the paper describing ETC. And we can see that this lookup function has a pretty straightforward spec. So it accepts a key of type T1 and a list of keys and values, respectively typed T1 and type 2. And it should return none or a value of type T2. And then in find, where lookup is used, and we also have a match of a string with the call to lookup, which gets a list as the second argument, but we, we see that this list definitely does not return uh, strings. And here we see that actually dialyzer times might be misleading because when we use spec diffs or over specs, it does return uh, a warning, but this warning doesn't really tell us much. And, uh, we see that the, the design assumptions that dialyzer always assumes the, inter, the implementation is right, not the spec, leads to situations like this, where uh, it just discards some of the information from the spec, some of the information that we provide, and it tells us, well, your spec is flaky, it's too narrow, the implementation can handle more. But then, at the same time, it does not detect the error, the, the match of a string with an integer being extracted from the list. Gradualizer, uh, sadly, because of a lack of a constraint solver, cannot properly uh, detect this error yet. This, this involves some uh, polymorphism in the spec. Gradualizer cannot do anything with it. But ETC properly reports a unification error in this case. So uh, to draw some conclusions from, from these examples, we can say that spec diffs is kind of equal to using under specs and over specs, but not exactly. In some cases, we need just spec diffs. We could also say that under specs is more or less uh, equivalent to gradualizers exhaustive, sorry, exhaustiveness checking, and uh, it detects things which are likely real bugs. So we should probably fail CI if we get these warnings. 
With over specs, it's not that clear. This requires some human analysis to figure out if it's really an error or if it's just a small inconsistency or nothing to worry about. So depending on the flags, we should fail CI or we should not fail CI. So should we run the dialyzer, dialyzer twice uh, in CI? Maybe, but it's not very fast. So we see that there is room for improvement. And there is some improvement happening, actually. So if you're interested in the type checker that never fails, that's never wrong. Uh, check out the talks by Jesper Eskilson and Thomas Davies. There's lots of good stuff. Jesper shows how to actually use the different sets of flags for the best results. Thomas Davies works on speeding up dialyzer significantly. Then we have some conclusions about uh, gradualizer. It already has a pretty good coverage of Erlang syntax and constructs. It's already quite useful in practice. It's also pretty fast. But there are still some known problems uh, to solve. Mm, false positives are among them and are a bit annoying, but there is not a lot of them. Uh, there are also some problems which are pretty low-hanging fruit, just nobody has yet approached solving them. They're uh, categorized as uh, these known problems uh, under tests. And the big thing is the constraint solver. So we don't get warnings if polymorphism or type variables are in play. And uh, going to ETC, it uses a pretty promising and tried and proved type uh, theory um, that, for example, is successfully applied in PureScript. But it crashes a lot on valid and ordinary code, so it's unfit for daily use yet. However, it does find some bugs the other two cannot find. So thumbs up for ETC on, on that. Uh, there are some more examples at the URL I previously shared. So if you're interested in, in that, uh, check it out. Uh, and then a short summary of what's uh, actually new and what's uh, on the roadmap. Um, we have hopefully uh, squashed all the exhaustiveness checking bugs in Gradualizer. Um, we're also working on Gradualizer successfully type checking itself. Uh, we're down to nine warnings from a few dozen or even a, a few hundred. And the rest are actually harder because they're either limitations or bugs in the type checker. And by limitations, I mean that uh, there's no mechanism in the tool yet to deal with some constructs. By bugs, I mean there is some mechanism, but it's not implemented fully, or there's, there are just some errors in the implementation. Uh, well, there are also some, uh, some issues found when cross-checking against the dialyzer and ETC. Some of them are in the tests, some of them are in the tools. Um, some of them are already fixed, but uh, this needs a bit more work. And, well, continuously, this is probably uh, going to be a never-ending story. Find new known problems, fix the existing known problems. <laughs> and the big thing I mentioned previously is the constraint uh, solver. Uh, we have also some, some done and some to-do items for Gradient. So recently we have uh, completed support for type annotations and assertions. Uh, an example of you could see in the demo. Uh, there is also ongoing work by Victor Rodriguez, uh, a former ESL uh, Erlang Solutions uh, employee on ignoring selected warnings, because for the time being, when we still have some false positives, it might be handy just to ignore some warnings. And uh, there are also some issues related to Elixir constructs, which are not present in the Erlang syntax, uh, specifically dot .access and the with keyword. This is simply code that gets generated by the Elixir compiler and leads to some uh, false positives, even, if, uh, even though it shouldn't. And it would also be nice to be able to run Gradient as a standalone tool, not necessarily as a mixed task. So mm, that's also a, a ticket. There are more in the tracker, but uh, it's too little time to list uh, all of them. So there is still some low-hanging fruit in both projects. Uh, if you have some spare time, uh, here is uh, an algorithm to uh, help you start contributing. <laughs> and 
there's also, uh, well, I would like to thank you, some people, uh, specifically Viktor Sederqvist, Przemek Wojtasik, Viktor Rodriguez, Experimental, and Pedro Martins, also known as Flame Phoenix, and in general, all the people who reported issues, contributed ideas, examples, uh, or code into any of the tools because it just makes the, any of the type checkers because it just makes the types, sorry, the Erlang ecosystem uh, better. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And. We have time for one or two questions, all right? So thank you for the great talk. And my question is uh, back to the demo. You mentioned that uh, there is an opaque uh, type T for process ID, which allows you to differentiate it from any other process IDs. So, uh, so on one hand, you have a different type, which somehow differentiate from other pins. But on the other hand, you need to return the, simply the process ID type because uh, this is what is used for starting the process. Is that right? So how yeah. can you tell when the opac type is different and how can you tell that if it opac speed it can be considered the same so how do how this differentiation happens actually um, so the differentiation well the value is actually the same value t exists only on the type level so it's only uh, taken into account by the type checker if we wanted to cast this value back into a pid a general pid to use some APIs that just accept a PID but not a T, uh, we would uh, have to use a type annotation. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Radek. Very interesting talk. Thank you.